Well, good morning, everybody. It's my great delight to be able to address this National Catholic Prayer Breakfast, at least in this virtual way. I'm recording these words from an unusually overcast uh, Santa Barbara, California today. Well, listen, you don't need me to tell you that we're going through a rather convulsive time in our national life. There are people bringing forward legitimate concerns about race and injustice, but others questioning the very foundations of our American political experiment. And some of the most iconic figures in our tradition, both civic and religious, are under attack. I mean, just recently there were suggestions made that in Washington itself, we take down monuments to George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson. Just recently, a prominent member of Congress suggested we remove the statue of St. Damien of Molokai from Statuary Hall. And out in my part of the world, attacks on statues of St. Junipero Serra are very common. Well, what I'd like to do in the very brief time I have this morning is to step back a bit and give a wider perspective and to show the relationship, the very important relationship between American democracy and a biblical view of the world. These two visions can and should come together. And I'll do it by looking very briefly at two figures, both under attack today, one in the civic order, the other in the religious, namely Thomas Jefferson and Junipero Serra. I think for Americans to think those two figures together is exceptionally important. Well, let's go back to um, that famously muggy, hot summer of 1776 in Philadelphia, where a young Virginia lawyer, he's 33 at the time, Jefferson was born in 1743, he's struggling to write the words to this uh, famous document. We know them well. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Now, here's what I want you to see, everybody. Though we take those words more or less for granted, they are very peculiar indeed, especially when you read them against the backdrop of the history of political philosophy. I say this now as someone who's taught political philosophy for many years. That all men and women are equal? That's self-evident? Go back to the classical political thinkers. It was anything but self-evident. In fact, it was self-evidently false. How are we equal precisely? In strength? In courage? In intelligence? In virtue? Pfft, none of those areas. We're radically unequal. Now consult the great political philosophers of antiquity, Cicero, Aristotle, Plato. You'll find that their conception of the rightly ordered city is based upon a keen awareness of just how unequal we are. Take Plato, for example, the famous vision he has in the Republic, predicated upon a sharp demarcation between three social classes, the guardians, the auxiliaries, and the, and the workers. All people equal? On the contrary, it's the inequality of the three classes, the acknowledgement of that, that's key to a rightly ordered uh, social situation. Aristotle, Plato's greatest pupil, same thing. There are a handful of people, Aristotle thought, who were capable of public or political life, a sort of uh, intellectual and moral elite. The vast majority of people, Aristotle felt, were not capable of it. In fact, some people were so constituted that slavery was their natural condition. All people are equal? Au contraire, I mean. And, and the acknowledgement of this inequality was key to the establishment of a right social order. So here's the interesting question. What happened? What happened between these classical thinkers and then this young 18th century Virginia lawyer who confidently says it's self-evident that all people are equal. The answer comes from those little words that tend to slide through our minds. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Unequal in intelligence, yes. Unequal in skill, yes. Unequal in virtue, yes, of course. But all equally children of God. Now, take God out of the equation. What happens? Well, I suggest consulting the 
tyrannies and totalitarianisms of the 20th century that operated on the assumption that God does not exist. Equality even esses pretty quickly when God is taken out of the equation. Now, the second part of Jefferson's famous um, prologue. They're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Hmm, everybody? Inalienable rights? Would Plato have said that? Absolutely not. Aristotle? No way. Again, a handful of the, of the intellectual and moral and, and social elite had certain rights and prerogatives. The vast majority of people did not. What happened? Why did it become suddenly self-evident to this 18th century lawyer that all people are endowed with these inalienable rights? Again, that little word that tends just to slip past our minds. Endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. God has given these rights to everybody. Mind you, the government does not give them. The state does not give them. The social elite do not offer them to a handful of, of their uh, privileged friends. No, no. Endowed by their creator. You know, something in George Will's book, uh, his, his recent uh, uh, book on American politics, which I disagree with in important ways, but a part of it I like very much. Will said the most important word in that prologue is secure. What he meant was Jefferson's view that governments exist to secure these rights, not create them, not grant them, but secure them, rights that have been given by another. That comes, I would say, from a basically biblical view of things. Okay, so there's Thomas Jefferson writing in the summer of 1776. Now go to the west coast of our continent at the exact same time. In fact, two days before the Declaration of Independence was ratified, on July the 2nd, 1776, there was a Franciscan friar called Junipero Serra who founded a mission called San Francisco de Assis, two days before the ratification of the Declaration. From that little mission came eventually the city of San Francisco. At the same time that our founding fathers were putting together the principles of our country, this friar was establishing a series of missions on the West Coast. Just a word about Junipero Serra, born 1713, so a slightly older contemporary of the American founding fathers. From the island of Mallorca off the coast of Spain, becomes a Franciscan as a young man, takes the name Junipero, his baptismal name was Miguel becomes a great scholar of the Franciscan theologian John Dunn Scotus. And then at the age of 35, pretty old for the time, he decides to leave his comfortable academic life and become a missionary in the New World. He sets off knowing full well he'd never return, and he never did. Spends some time in Mexico, then some time working in the missions in Baja, California, and then in his 50s, Again, quite old for the time, he commences his career establishing these missions in what's now our state of California. He dies in 1784, buried in the beautiful mission he founded up in Carmel. Now, was Junipero Serra accompanied by uh, Spanish military as he established the missions? Yes. And often those missions were accompanied by presidios or military establishments. But was he interested in the consolidation of Spanish political and military power? Absolutely not. Even the most cursory survey of his life shows that the dominant passion of his life was evangelization, was sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, which he took to be the greatest gift he could possibly give to the native peoples of this country. That was Junipero Serra's preoccupation. That's what fired his heart. You know, a couple of details. Do you know that in 1773, Sarah made his way from California all the way back to Mexico City, there to argue for a kind of bill of rights for the native people. Born now of his deep Christian faith, his deep sense that the rights of these people he was evangelizing should be respected. Another interesting detail, and a key point the mission that he had established in San Diego was attacked. It was destroyed. 
and dear friends of his, fellow Franciscans, were killed by some of the native peoples. There was a rush to put these killers to death. Junipero Serra said, no, no, no. Preserve their lives that they might be saved, that they might hear the gospel. It's very interesting. You could argue that the first principled opposition to capital punishment articulated in the space of what is now the United States was precisely that statement of Junipero Serra. Now, here's what I want you to see, everybody. Even though there's no direct connection, obviously, I'm not arguing that, but there is indeed a very profound indirect connection between what was happening on these two coasts of our continent at the same time. Thomas Jefferson was able to say the things he said because at least to a degree, now I know he's probably more deist than, than Orthodox Christian, but nevertheless, Jefferson could say the things he said because at least to some degree he had been evangelized. To some degree he had heard the good news. What Sarah was doing explicitly on the West Coast was in many ways the condition for the possibility of what Jefferson was saying and accomplishing on the East Coast. The coming together of the gospel and our democracy. That, friends, I think, is a permanently valuable insight. You know, in 1831, so just five years after Jefferson died, a young French diplomat arrived on these shores, Alexis de Tocqueville. De Tocqueville examined the American scene. He had a great love for American democracy, a great respect for it. But he saw something which remains of permanent value to this day, namely, that American democracy will flourish only in the measure that it is grounded in a basic moral and spiritual vision of things. Take away the moral and spiritual framework, and American democracy will devolve in short order into factionalism or the tyranny of the majority. Valid in 1831? Mm-hmm. Valid today, absolutely. Look at the two great social movements, one in the 19th century, one in the 20th. I'm talking about abolition and civil rights. How important that those two great social movements were led by people who had been deeply evangelized. Think of the leaders of the abolitionist movement in the 19th century. Think of those great heroic leaders of the civil rights movement in the 20th century. Both had been deeply evangelized by the Christian gospel. And so it goes, so it goes with this relationship between what Sarah was doing on the West Coast, what Jefferson was doing on the East Coast. So just a last thought, everybody. There's a tendency today, and I've, I've noticed the last, oh, maybe 30 years or so, to privatize religion, to turn the faith into something like a hobby, something we adepts whisper among ourselves. But this is repugnant to the nature of Christianity and what I'm suggesting, and is repugnant to the health of a democracy. A privatized religion is bad for religion. It's bad for democracy. So what's the best thing that we can all do? I think follow the promptings of the Second Vatican Council. The universal call to holiness. Bring your faith into the public arena this way, by being great Catholic lawyers, great Catholic politicians, great Catholic business leaders, great Catholic entertainers, great Catholic teachers, and not incidentally so, but essentially so. Resist the temptation to privatize the faith, but rather bring your evangelized self into the public forum. Good for religion good for our democracy. Let's honor today both these figures operating at the same time, late 18th century, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast. Let's honor both Thomas Jefferson and St. Junipero Serra. And God bless all of you.